A reading from Isaiah. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all their waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me and my justice for light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever and my deliverance will never be ended. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others and do not be dismayed when they revile you. For the moth will eat up like a garment and a worm will eat like wool. But my deliverance will be forever and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Tomorrow will be disorienting for many of our families. And even if you don't have children in public schools, the start of this particular school year will disorient you too. With buses back on the roads for the first time in almost six months, we will be abruptly reintroduced to 7 a.m. traffic and backups that reach well into the early evening. In fact, it's been so long, it may feel like we're traveling through a city we're visiting for the first time. Tomorrow will mark a return to in-person instruction for maybe one-sixth of Greenville County Public School students, while everyone else will begin the school year on laptops and desktops, strategically placed on kitchen tables and bedroom desks. Teachers, including some of you, will continuously shift from screens and the faces in your classrooms from the virtual to the embodied. Coaches will train athletes unsure if there will actually be anything to compete for this year. Rising seniors will begin their capstone high school experience, concerned that they'll join the class of 2020 in a year of delays and cancellations and shelved senior moments. Kindergartners and first graders, just getting the first taste of school life tomorrow may wait another six months or more to really discover what it's all about. Tomorrow will be disorienting. Some of it new, and a lot of it a continuation of the twilight zone we've inhabited since the first week in March. It's not just the schools, is it? We're disoriented in the grocery stores. We're disoriented in office spaces, recreational venues, athletic facilities. We're disoriented on Sunday mornings as well, in a manner that reaches into hearts and minds, stirring those inevitable questions of faith and purpose. When's this gonna end? 
what else is going to happen tomorrow? Where's the light in all of this, God? The laments of a bewildered people. Listen to me, God says through the prophecy of Isaiah. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out for me and my justice for a light to the peoples. Long before our present struggle, the people of God experienced a disorientation so pervasive, so intense, that it upends families and cities, a nation, for generations. Like us, the people of God don't seek the upheaval. The disorientation of mass migration to Babylon is forced upon the people of God, and it comes in a flood of confusion and anger, scapegoating and grief. Any of that sound familiar to you? As you might imagine, the people of God can function on adrenaline at first. We all can. That zap of energy and collective purpose that has us rising up when the crisis arrives, pulling it together, looking out for our neighbors as we attend to our own, taking the necessary steps that are needed to slow the losses and stabilize the situation. At first, we push back at our adversaries, don't we? even the microscopic ones. But when the days become weeks and the weeks become months or more, the adrenaline supply is just tapped out. The laments become longer. They're more frequent. Our shared experience of disorientation, the chaos, can bring forth our worst impulses, not our best. That's certainly what's happening in Isaiah's setting. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out for me and my justice for a light to the peoples. Today we find Isaiah stepping into the chaos with a particular vocation, a specific call from God. His task is to try to reorient the disoriented people of God toward hope, not a deepened despair. He will try to bolster those who are still upright and shuffling ahead in righteousness, while also lifting up those who no longer seem to have the will to continue the journey. Isaiah does all of this on God's behalf, by first summoning powerful examples from the past. Look back at the rock you came from, Isaiah says. Look at the foundation that holds you up. Abraham and Sarah, your ancestral parents, from their struggle and faithfulness came countless descendants. You see, Isaiah is reminding the people of God that they've been in this chaotic place before. Disorientation has always been part of the story. And because the disoriented ones of every generation can learn from those who previously made it to the other side of the upheaval, Isaiah believes that there are already good lessons, good examples in place for the people of God. Look back to the rock you come from. And look around you, Isaiah continues. Look down at the earth and up to the heavens. The heavens may wisp away like smoke. The earth may become tattered. Some of the people may fall, but salvation, deliverance that comes from God, will remain intact forever. The whole trajectory of Isaiah's prophecy culminates in the implied look ahead, awake, gird yourself in strength, 
and look ahead. Look ahead and envision your return to the sacred spaces and holy ground. Look ahead to that day when singing returns to Zion. Look ahead to a time when sorrow and sighing will be displaced by joy and gladness. Isaiah seems to be saying, now is the time to look ahead. We live in a disoriented time, chaotic time, what we might call trying times, especially when they are protracted like they are now far beyond what we ever imagined was possible when all this began to unravel back in March. And when we find ourselves in disorienting times, they have a way of heightening our anxiety, stirring our despair, and pushing us to act out in ways that create more distance, more hardship, more laments. As I mentioned just a few days ago, these times are exhausting for us, primarily because of the way we treat each other when we hurt. Maybe it's time to turn around and to look ahead. When we are disoriented, and we are, we must look back at our past and recognize that those who entered the chaos long before us, those rocks in our histories, emerged from the chaos, showing us how to do the same. When we are disoriented with fingers pointed and laments on our lips, we are called to look at heaven and earth for assurance that the creator of all of it will hold us in love even if everything is washed away. When we are disoriented, hope compels us to look ahead in faith that we will sing, move freely and embrace no masks needed anymore. That's why I'm looking ahead to Monday morning, tomorrow morning. I hope you are too. I'm looking ahead to the mess on Woodruff Road. I'm looking ahead to the kids balking at getting up at 7 a.m. for their virtual return to school. I'm looking ahead to all the confusion and chaos that will greet us at the beginning of a school year. Because it's a start, isn't it? Look ahead, people of God. Look ahead in hope. Take a step in faith. Amen.